Hey, and welcome everybody. <clears throat> welcome everybody to uh, our Accuretta webinar. And if that music doesn't have you getting up out of your seats and ready to move forward with uh, Accuretta and the sole printer, I don't know what else does. My name's Tom Caulfield, uh, general manager here at Accuretta for the Americas. Um, I'm in a hotel room uh, outside of the Yankee Dental Convention Center. And uh, the neighbors just knocked on the, on the, on the wall and said, hey, you got to turn that music down. Um, but we're excited, right? We're excited. It's Accuretta. We got an incredible webinar here for you. And of course, the question or the answer that everybody is waiting for is milling obsolete. We've got the answer for you, but we're not going to share it quite yet. You're going to have to wait a little bit for this. So again, my name is Tom Caulfield, General Manager of the Americas. And is milling obsolete in the endless possibilities of the 3D printing? It's a lecture presented by Lee Culp, CEO of Sculpture Studios, and co-hosted by PacDent, a resin manufacturer with over 30 years plus in dental. And PacDent is represented by Ryan Solorzano, Chief Product Manager at PacDent. In today's presentation, Lee will be sharing how 3D printing has changed his lab workflows, where he's been able to implement 3D printing application, and where he and his team are seeing opportunities for printing. Lee will share his personal experiences using Pactent rodent sculpture material that has opened new avenues for printing restorations and begs the question, is milling obsolete? Please stay tuned after this presentation for live Q&A session immediately following this lecture. Ryan, Lee, and myself will be here to answer all your questions. And if you have anything that comes to the top of your mind while Lee's going through this lecture, Use our chat feature on the bottom right hand side and just fill in your question there and we'll make we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions at the end of this presentation. This presentation is being recorded uh, and will be uh, available on the Accuretta YouTube channel. Anybody that's registered uh, for this uh, for this webinar will automatically have access uh, in a link that was previously sent to you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Lee Culp. Lee's a CDT and CEO of Sculpture Studios. It's a dental laboratory loca located in beautiful North Carolina. Sculpture Studios is a product and development center for new and innovative digital diagnostics, resource and digital applied applications to surgical and restorative dentistry. Most recently, Lee's, and I'm sure most of you on this call have already either know Lee, know the name or have met him in person, most recently, he's been awarded the Hall of Fame Award by the National Association of Dental Laboratories and in 2022, the EV Award for Outstanding Innovation in Dentistry, awarded by the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Lee is an avid writer and is a contributor to many, many, many dental textbooks, including a chapter in Dr. Peter Dawson's book, Functional Occlusion from TMJ to Smile Design. Ryan Sol Solorzano, he's a technician by training and a CDT, Ryan has over 20 years of experience in digital restorative dentistry and is a member of the R&D team at PacDent. And prior to PacDent, Ryan was, Ryan was also R&D lead at Glidewell Laboratories, heavily involved in researching innovative 3D printing materials. So just before we uh, begin the lecture today, and you see Lee's photo here, is milling obsolete? And again, Lee will have that answer for you before the end of this presentation. I just wanna make sure that everybody follows um, Accuretta online and where we can be found in other webinars that might be useful if you're into 3D printing now or even just considering 3D printing. Um, in February 2nd, we'll have a live uh, webinar with our new Alpha AI Premium software. Alpha AI Premium is what we power to uh, slice and dice our uh, our, our our output here, uh, and it's a software uh, for our Accuretta system. So February 2nd, another webinar coming up. And then, of course, you'll find us at Chicago Midwinter. Um, we'll be at booth um, at Lab Day and Chicago Midwinter. Pactent will also be at Lab Day in booth Q10. We'll be located right next to them in booth Q9. And then at Chicago Midwinter, Pactent will be at booth 3112, uh, and you'll see we'll be at booth 1638. Uh, you'll be able to visit us and see us in person at those two events. Also, you'll get to meet and greet Lee. 
He's also hosting uh, this presentation, but a little more detailed and, and a little more hands-on with live printing that we'll be doing. Um, so make sure you register for that course. Um, you'll see it at diff on, all on social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and you'll be able to register for his course uh, February 25th at the uh, Lab Day. And then, of course, another uh, another webinar hosted uh, here by Accuretta with Denturis, Eugene uh, Roisengert, uh, February 24th. If for some reason you can't make it to Lab Day and you wanted to um, and you wanted to uh, have this presentation, uh, you'll be able to view it online for a webinar. And then, of course, all the wonderful things that we're going to speak about. And we always have to make sure that how does this fit in our budget and where do we purchase it from, right? And you can see our winter special here from Accuretta. The entire system, the sole printer, the cleaning, the, the curing machine, the software, and an incredible package for Q2, uh, $900 in value. And with that, you'll see $89.89 is our promotional price. What a great deal to get it just to be able to step into printing. And then, of course, if for some reason you didn't want to purchase it at $89.89 and wanted to finance it over 24 months, approximately $389 is your finance, um, is, your, is your monthly cost. And that is a turnkey solution to get into printing. And I don't know of another company out there that has this type of offer where you can step into printing for just $389. So $89.89 is the MSRP for the entire package. And it includes um, it includes a $900 value uh, in addition. $389 would be the monthly payment over 24 months if you choose not to uh, purchase, uh, make one payment uh, and spread it out over 24 months. And then, of course, who do you buy it from, right? And we have some great resellers that we sell our product through. We do not sell direct. Everything is through our channel distribution. Um, we, we, we know they do such a wonderful job in uh, installing and taking care of, of our doctors. Um, Atlanta Dental Supply, Burkhart Dental, Cadre, and then our newest channel partner, Henry Shine Dental. All four of those resellers will have product available for you. And all you have to do is connect with one of your favorite salespeople and let them know you're looking for the Accuretta product. With that, with that said, um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Lee Culp. And uh, again, Lee, I know you're going to have the answer for us. Is milling obsolete? I will. From you. We'll talk to you later on uh, at the end of the <clears> event. <throat> Stick around for live Q&A and any questions you have regarding clinical, uh, laboratory, or uh, uh, sales as far as, you know, where can I get this and how soon can I get it? Thanks, Lee. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Uh, very excited to be here today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is 3D printing and having Accurita and PacDent sponsor me because I use both of those products uh, and have been uh, for several years now. So one of the coolest things, because I've been printing about as long as you can be printing in dentistry. We had the big VAT printers over 12 years ago. Very, very expensive. Uh, printing really changed in dentistry when we went to desktop printers and the prices came down to below 10,000. Actually, some of the first ones were below 3,000. <clears> so it, it allowed access to everybody. And we've just seen it grow and grow and grow since then until what we know is gonna happen in the future and what we can do today. It is endless, it's endless in the possibilities. So we're gonna talk about, is milling obsolete? And I'm gonna answer that question at the end and just kind of show you where we are. So today we're gonna to talk about printing and what you can do and what we do here in our laboratory. So everything in our laboratory is based on machines. We use artificial intelligence on a daily basis to do a lot of our work. Uh, one of the things we do and our main goal here is diagnostic, surgical, and restorative work. And we do a lot of surgical restorative, but again, a lot of diagnostic work also. So artificial intelligence plays a big role in those two, uh, especially with our surgical work. Every case we do, we send to an artificial intelligence robot and they will segment and turn our CTs and STLs so we can finally make something. So we use artificial intelligence on a daily basis. Robotic manufacturing, so that's mills and printers. Um, 
I have rooms full of mills and printers, and they make everything that comes out of our laboratory today. We do have people that input data. We do have a lot of data coming from our clients in the, you know, in the form of an intraoral scan. And then we're doing all of our designing on computer. We do have technicians that finish things. Uh, we still have to stain and glaze and color and put things together at the end, but it's overwhelmingly robotic manufacturing. If we can't get hey, it out Lee, of a mill or a I printer. Just, hey Lee, can I just jump in yeah. here for a moment? I think sure. I think your screen is frozen. Uh, well, uh, let me push the button and see. So did did augmented reality just come up? No. So, so let's see if I'm changing. I love technology lectures where the technology doesn't allow you to lecture. So I'm going to completely change the slide, Tom. And it should say digital team. No. Nope. So maybe uh, what if you turn your camera on? My camera on. So you can, sorry guys, so you can see my screen. Uh, I do not see your screen. All I do is see a photo of you. Okay. Okay, there we go. Now. Coming up. Yeah, you're, 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 you're starting up now, yep. Okay, um, apologies for that. Well, it's, it's good I haven't it's showed not, a lot of it's not there yet, but there you go. Artificial intelligence just came up late. All right. Well, I did reset a button there. So I'm going to pop back through those because I've already talked about artificial intelligence, robotic manufacturing, and augmented reality. So we are using several augmented reality programs now for patient communication to show patients what we can do for them before we actually do anything. But it's changed a lot in the dental digital team because we are a digital team now. And one of the things digital has allowed us to do more than anything else is communicate in ways we never have before. Me with my clients, uh, dentist to dentist, laboratory to dentist, we, we can look at 3D patients on the screen, we can plan, we can communicate like we never have before, and then decide what we're going to do and create those with 3D pinning. So we're kind of redefining the roles we've had over the last several years, because when I started as a technician, I started as a crown and bridge technician and made, you know, spent many years in ceramics and developing systems in ceramics. <clears throat> but I was asked to be on the three shape Ivoclar team, the denture development team, digital denture development team. And unfortunately, I knew nothing about doing dentures, but digitally, I was able to figure it out very, very quickly. Within three days, I knew how to make a denture. Wasn't a master at it, but I knew how to make a denture. So even the titles Crown and Bridge and Removable in the digital world are kind of going away. But it even gets more interesting when we look at what we're doing today. So I am a clinical technician. I do perio work, I do surgery, I do orthodontics, I do all the things that are clinical, I just do it on a screen on a virtual patient. But at the same time, you are now becoming, if you're a dentist watching, you're becoming a technical dentist. And one of the things that will allow you to do that is 3D printing because you are now going to be designing your own restorations. And it's funny because I've never had a problem with that. Uh, I was the technician who ran to CEREC, not ran away from them afraid because I thought it was cool technology. So I'm doing a little of your work. You're doing a little of my work. I think it's very cool that we're all doing that. And then the most fun, at least in my world, is restorative surgeons, which are learning and becoming involved from a restorative standpoint for the surgeries we're doing. So we're all digital technicians today. And it's kind of cool that we can do these things, pass them around to each other and communicate like we never have before. 
My laboratory doesn't look anything like a normal digi uh, dental laboratory. We're a lot of computers, a lot of printers, and a lot of mills, and then some of the most smartest people that I have working with me uh, putting all these things together. So we specialize in surgery here. That's the one thing we do, surgery and restorative. So I'm going to kind of work around that today, showing you some of the things that we can only do because of printing. I mean, we can really only do what we do because of printing and high precision printing. I can't design implements for surgery unless they are perfectly accurate and we go out of our way to make those things happen. It all starts with the digital data coming in to us in the form of CTs and intraoral scans. And there's a lot of good CTs and intraoral scans out there now. <clears throat> if you're looking and you're watching today's presentation and you're not intraoral scanning at this point, one of the things you definitely want to go look at is intraoral scanning because it allows you to do the things we're talking about today. So we're going to kind of focus on implants, dentures, and things like that today. We'll talk, we're also going to talk about crowns because we are starting to do permanent restorations with these materials. And we'll talk about what you need for a permanent restoration and what qualifies as a, per, as a permanent restoration. Because the ADA code changed their codes for this year. So if you're using a printed material like Pack Dent Sculpture, which has over 50% filler, <coughs> it falls in to the requisite um, material specifications <coughs> to do permanent restorations and have it covered under insurance. So again, we've been doing a lot of surgery for over 10 years now, and I've had a lot of great mentors. All my friends are prosthodontists or surgeons. My wife is also a prosthodontic, uh, prosthodontist and surgeon. So it's kind of nice because I've got a lot of lifelines that I can go to. <clears throat> so one of the things we developed several years ago in our evolution of development was the ability to combine surgical information with restorative information in ways that nobody else had done yet. So when we look at what we can do, and it is because of printing, <coughs> excuse me, that we are able to do these things. So we're going to take a, <coughs> we're going to take a simple restoration and implant design here replacing the lower lateral incisor. And we've got an intraoral scan. And we've done a diagnostic wax up into that intraoral scan. We're also going to import a CT scan. And we're going to place those two files together. We can actually very accurately overlay the CT onto the iOS scan. So we've got both information. We need the iOS to make the guide because it's going to sit on the teeth, especially on this one. We can also do tissue and bone. But once we look, we're, we're designing it not just where the bone is, but we really are taking into consideration where the final tooth is and trying to place the implant in such a way that it can be screw retained. So we're looking at a lot of things and the ability to make a guide because we want that screw access hole to come out slightly lingual of the incisal edge. So we're doing our surgical planning based on our restorative planning. And then many, many years ago, we figured out how to bring in that surgical data into the restorative data within the software and then design the temporary at the same time. This is a process we figured out about over eight years ago. So we're going to design a provisional that's going to fit over the implant and its temporary cylinder. And it's going, if you can see the little wings, it's going to rest on the adjacent teeth. Now, this is where everything has to be incredibly positioned because when I'm looking at a printer, I'm looking at price, number not number one, but one of the things we're looking at, to be honest, is price from a businessman because the printers I used in the beginning were literally $150,000. And then when the desktops came in, we went to less than 10,000. And the desktops are kind of in that range right now, which is 
affordable for everybody. And we were able to start printing very, very easily within a lab and within a clinic. Labs kind of jumped onto this first, but the biggest market for printers today is, is dentists because of all the things you can do with the printer in your office. So once we have the provisional designed, I know where to put the hole in it. So the hole is going to be actually a little bit larger than normal. So that it'll go over the temporary cylinder very, very nicely. And the whole manufacturing process looks like this. It sits on the adjacent teeth. I'm going to place the hole in it so it slides over the temporary cylinder. And we've got immediate smile design for this very simple lower incisor, looking something like this. So this is where we go to our 3D printing. So everything we do here in temporaries is 3D printed. Now, this is, we, we do a lot of work. I mean, we're not a huge laboratory, but we're a medium-sized laboratory, and we're very productive in what we do. So we do a lot of temporaries because we specialize in full arch restorations. So we have not, and this is an important statement, both for dentists and laboratories to really understand and how powerful the statement is. We have not milled PMMA for a temporary in over two years. And we have not had any major catastrophic failure. On some of the full arches in over two and a half years, I've had two that we went a little bit far on the cantilevers, but these things are holding up phenomenally well. So we do our temporary zone teeth, we do our temporary zone implant, and if there's ever a material or a situation that is going to stress a material, it's putting something on top of an implant because there is absolutely no give. I mean, there's the, everything is static directly to the restoration, and we just haven't had any problems. So it has allowed us as a laboratory to do things a lot faster because I can mill several different temporaries at the same time, or print them, sorry, but when I mill, I can only really mill one at a time, and especially full arches, I can mill and I can mill one at a time, or I can print several at a time, and the printing process is faster also, so it gives me better throughput. So whether you're a dentist or a laboratory, those things become very important to you. So we have several printers here. Uh, we were very very honored to be chosen to kind of test out the new soul from Ecarita when it came into the country. And we've been doing a lot of our precision work, all of our teeth, all of our precision work on the Ecarita soul. The thing you want to look at, because we didn't have this in the beginning when we had printers, one of the printers I used came with instructions after it was printed and you clean it off where there was no instructions there either. It was basically go put it outside in the sunlight for an hour. Now everything is very, very well documented. So in the Acurita system, you've got a very tightly integrated system from the print to the wash to the cure. Now, why is that important? <clears throat> because the curing and the washing help the precision. So you don't want to, you, you, you want it to be cleaning at a certain amount of time at a certain rate. Same thing with curing. You don't want to just put it in a cure box. So with the Accurita system, you dial in what material you're using. It's already been pre-calibrated for the materials you're going to use, so it cures properly. And the most important Thing, one of the most important things in printing is a proper cure. That's where you get most of your strength. It prints very nicely and it's cured enough to form a 3D surface, but it's the cleaning and really essentially the cure at the end that gives it its final strength. And all of these things are integrated together and calibrated together, and that's incredibly important for efficiency and long-term success of whatever you're making, whether that's a splint or a crown. So we clean and then we cure. Uh, high intensity flash cure timed. You know, you're not you're not just pushing a button at five minutes. Every material is calibrated to cure properly. And Accurita's, I think there are over a hundred materials that they can use in their printing system right now.
And this is us printing lots of things. <clears throat> so the other one that I'm going to talk about today, because we've been testing printing materials since they started coming out in the laboratory. So one of the first things I did was use some of the materials in the beginning to print our full arch all on X restorations. And I said, this is cool. And we got our first one out of the printer and the detail was so much nicer than a mill. There was hardly any finishing to it. And we did several and they all broke. I mean, literally they all broke. So I immediately told everybody, don't do this. But the materials have evolved a lot since that time because this was seven or eight years ago. Now we print everything. Every temporary that goes on a tooth or an implant comes out of a printer. And the one we've been focusing on, because again, I was very nicely invited by PacDent, Ryan and others on the R&D team to help in the development of some of these materials. And one of the ones we got most excited about was sculpture. So in trepidation, I started printing full arch implant temporaries again, and nothing happened. There were no reports of breakage. Everything was good. We were seeing long-term stability, long-term stability. We weren't seeing staining. We were seeing really phenomenal, excellent results. And we are completely PMMA milling free for these types of restorations now. Everything is printed. So we print, so we print the model, we print the temporary restoration, we print the guide. And then everything if everything is calibrated together, the precision we see on the model is exactly the precision you're going to see in the mouth. And one of the things we hear uh, over and over and over again is the precision of our guides and the fit of our guides is like a crown. When they look through the holes, because we've got visualization holes, it's intimate fit. And it has to be, especially on interior restorations where you're doing an implant and you can't have any deviation. You can't have that guide moving around. So the guide has been printed and the implant has been placed, and then a temporary cylinder is placed on top. And then the immediate load restoration that I created simply goes right over the top of it. So it's sitting on the two adjacent teeth, precision, because we put viewing windows in there too, so it's exactly where it needs to go. And then we're going to loot the restoration, the printed restoration to the temporary cylinder, and then cut the wings off. So it looks like that after a little bit of cleanup uh, around the gingival, because there's going to be a little bit of excess. And then that restoration is ready to go into the mouth. And when we finally decide to take that restoration to the end, then we just really use the same file and turn that into a zirconia restoration, basically using the same shape and file. So the other thing that I've really started, because we tested all these materials when they first came out. So we had lots of printers. We tested every material in printing dentures. And I need to say right now, I was incredibly disappointed because the colors were off. Uh, the fit was bad. I mean, there was really nothing good about the first printed dentures coming out. Uh, they were unesthetic. Um, I can go on and on. But we've seen, and this is one of the, the challenges and one of the reasons I wanted to work with Accurita is to get that fit as good as a mill denture. Because we've done lots of research. Uh, in this picture you see here is Dr. Nadine Baba, uh, Eric Kakuchka, who did a lot of development with me, myself, my wife, and again, one of my closest friends, Dr. Lyndon Cooper. We've done a lot of research, both clinical and testing, on all these materials. And we've seen them, I mean, definitively get better, stronger, more aesthetic as the years have gone on. So we're to the point now where we're ready to start printing dentures for our high-end dentures because everybody immediately made excuses. Well, these are good for your low-end economy dentures. Well, I don't do low-end economy dentures. I, I want something 
premium. I want something that's going to look as good as anything else on the market. And then we can stain, we can add composites for those really high end looks, but we, we can do some cool things. So to mill or print, that's the question in dentures. In the beginning, it was mill. 100% hands down, uh, desktop validation, clinical validation, and university studies, absolutely mill. But we've seen the printers and these materials getting so much better that we are now starting to move to printing for all of our dentures. Now, we are not a denture lab. We do dentures kind of to pre-design all of our implant cases. But I mean, in some of the other printing early on, we still were not getting that perfect palatal seal. And even with some of the most expensive printers out there, where with milling, we were getting excellent results. So then we started doing surface analysis to really see where they were, and then designing different support strategies to take care. Because one of the areas that's important on a denture is that palatal seal. There were no real support structure definitive on where it should go to get the best fit or print. It was just, if you want to print a denture, put the supports on. But then we started evaluating different supports uh, and ways to make those dentures fit better. So they're fitting phenomenal now. I mean, we're up into the, looking at the screen, we're up into the high 90s on being able to match it back to that original impression. So some of the early printed dentures were not so aesthetic, um, as you see with the teeth material and, but we've evolved to do some of the things I'm going to show you today. But we did a lot of clinical research and other. And then we started breaking things. So we, we designed a lot of different shapes. Uh, and did a lot of research on strength, ability, impact strength, things like that. Uh, and again, the, the milled materials were better in the beginning. Uh, the printed materials have definitively caught up to those materials now. So let's go from a smaller case to a little bit larger case. So <clears throat> we do a lot of, this is what we do. We do a lot of full arch cases in zirconia on implants. And we still do ceramics. We still have technicians that finish the work to give us these beautiful final aesthetics that we see here. So whether it's printed or milled, we still have to have very talented technicians finishing and doing the, the final finish work on these restorations to get them to the perfect aesthetics that we would like to see for our patients and your patients to be able to do this type of work. And we brought all of that knowledge of doing these cases into dentures. So we use the denture software a lot and printing to kind of pre-plan where we're going to go surgically and restoratively. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, but now, like I said, we're starting to print our final dentures uh, because of the shades, the opacities, everything has gotten so much better. I mean, one of the, one of the, proudest things I think Ryan and I are of the rodent system is the aesthetics of sculpture. So even though it's mono, it's, it's a monolithic material, we designed it in such a way to give the appearance of layering or of shading. So we picked the perfect balance of translucency and chroma. So at the bottom where it's a little bit thicker, it looks denser, more like dentin. At the top where it gets thinner, it actually looks like it's got enamel layering on it. So it's it's really cool stuff. But when we start with a denture digitally, we're going to do a lot of the same things. Now, just so you know, I have no idea how to do a denture by hand. Couldn't if you paid me a million dollars, I couldn't do one because I just don't know how to do it. Digitally, like I said, I learned about in three days. So we're doing our borders. We have to have great impressions. It still depends on great impressions, whether it's a digital impression or whether it's an analog impression. The impression sets up whether the fit is going to be good or bad, because I can definitely make it fit the, the models or the impressions or the scans, uh, but it has to be, that has to be perfect back to the mouth. 
So we're setting our teeth. Uh, in dental, if you're if you're a technician or if you're a dentist, because I know so many dentists who are doing a lot of this on their own now. Uh, so the cool thing about setting teeth is they come in preset for you. They're locked in place, the uppers and lowers, in an optimal denture tooth position. Not to say you can't move them because you can if you want to unlock them, but you're basically taking both arches and moving them around in your screen until you get it exactly where you want it anatomically, functionally, and aesthetically. And then the tissue just kind of goes from where you drew your border to a line on the teeth and it just kind of jumps into place. So once we get the teeth, we add the tissue. And we can move, we can look at it. Uh, this is some of the things we do with facial scanning. So we've got a 3D face, we've got 3D models, we've got 3D teeth, and we can actually look at what we're doing and position things. Once we've got it down, we can actually modify those positions a little bit based on the patient and their face. So we get our final denture and then we go to printing. Printing the teeth, printing the base, doing a try-in. And then a lot of people will print their dentures in one piece, one color. Uh, I don't like to do that. It doesn't really take any longer if you've got a couple of printers in your laboratory or office. If you got one in, if you only have one in your office, then you may want to think about doing them in one color. We print no matter what we're doing, if it's a try-in, if it's an immediate, if it's a final, we print the base and the tissue color, we print the teeth and the tooth color. And this is how we make a denture today. So we have the denture base and we have the teeth. So we're taking some of the liquid denture base material and painting it inside of the socket where the teeth are gonna go. So with a small brush, we're just gonna place that in there filled up and then we're going to place the teeth in and then this is an invention I created for holding things together it's called the denture clamp that'll hold the teeth right to the base while we go to light curing and we're setting up the rest of the cases so this is how we make dentures today. And then final insertion, I did do a little composite work on the tissue to, you know, give it some, a little more life because we do a lot of high-end work here. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it right. And we've got beautiful, beautiful results. So we've talked about implants a little bit and the precision that is needed to make the guides. We've talked about dentures. Now we're going to kind of put these things together by making our, our try-in dentures with fiduciary markers. Now, one of the really cool things, and I, I literally just realized this not too long ago because I was designing a case where we did exactly the workflow that I like to do, which is extract teeth, do immediate dentures. And I did it with uh, the pack dent rodent material, the sculpture material, but the sculpture material is also radiopaque. So we do use fiduciary markers to tie everything together, but the teeth are radiopaque and they just, they just float. I mean, on the CT, when you're placing your implants, you know exactly where the teeth are because they glow on the CT scan. And we didn't really realize how radiopaque they were. So again, based on the denture, we're going to create the guide. And then one of the things, if you look at, it looks a little strange here. So we start the denture that I originally started with in our immediate dentures. I'm taking that same file. And what I'm doing is now converting that denture for you. So when I send a guide out, I'm going to send your immediate load prosthetic with it. So I've taken the same denture, teeth are in the same position, occlusion the same, everything's good unless there were changes. And now I'm going in and creating windows. So the conversion process for you in the clinic is just to cut off those eight little notches and you're done because we're also going to bring in the implant positions 
and we're going to pre put the holes in the denture. So the denture uh, or actually the fixed temporary once you cut off these, but we leave enough of the struts to make it very stable in the mouth. We know exactly where the holes need to be because we brought in the coordinates of the implants into the denture software. So the guide is printed, the denture is printed, the teeth are printed, the model is printed. Everything you see here is printed. In fact, I've got three really nice expensive mills and we honestly only use two of them now because when we really changed everything into printing, I've got too many mills in my laboratory right now. But this is, everything is printed and placed together, glazed and polished. The two match up perfectly. And then we'll go through a case real quick. So I'm not going to spend too long on this case because I want to focus on the printing, but we are going to do implants in the lower and then a final fixed Ivoclar or, or uh, zirconia restoration. So I digitally extracted the teeth and made a denture to figure out where I wanted my teeth on the bottom, approved it with a doctor. And we even kind of, he even told me, this is where I'd like the, the access holes to come out. So I'm going to import all that and see how it all lines up. So we're going to place and we're going to import all that into the CT scan and pin it all together. See how close we can get to our original positions. And then make our guide. And make our denture and make it temporary. So a lot of times on these cases, I send uh, a temporary and denture just in case because it's the same file. It's not a big deal to be able to do that. But just in case you can't load, you've got to we have a denture. So I have extracted the teeth, done a little slight uh, bone reduction and tissue reduction. So again, I can measure exactly to see that I have enough restorative room making a guide and then we're going to bring those coordinates into the temporary and i've kind of done uh same thing kind of a outrigger situation where we're sitting on the uh, bone on the lingual and on the anterior and on tuberosities in the back retromolar pads and we're going to line all that up all the holes match perfectly so when we go in the mouth So we're going to print the denture on this one. Uh, we're also going to, we printed it as one color because we didn't expect we were going to need a denture. But since we had the denture already decide, designed, Dr. Cooper said, we'll print it out anyway, and I'll use it just to verify that implants are going in in the right place. So we have models printed. We have guide printed. We have restoration printed. Everything is printed. And the denture, we printed it out of one color, we put the holes in it so he could see and just verify that the implants were in the right place. So everything is printed. And then it's a tooth tissue supported guide. So he's gonna place the implants, check it with our printed denture prosthetic guide, do a little bone reduction, finalize the implants, Checking through the holes, they're exactly where they need to be, which is a good thing. And then the final temporary, the precision temporary, slips right over the top, over the temporary cylinders. And then he attaches those together after checking the bite. And then once everything is attached together, I did add very quickly some uh, uh, composite tissue to it to finalize it, but you can see where the holes are coming out, the temporary cylinders, exactly where we designed everything. And we're using a highly filled resin sculpture to print it out uh, to do our restoration. So there's our final temporary restoration. And our implants positions and then we're going to eventually make that into zirconia as our final restoration. So 
when it becomes even more complex, the accuracy of your printer becomes more important. So doing an anterior and having that implant go, sometimes threading a needle to get it exactly where you want to, the precision is 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 ultimate so that's what i'm looking for and we do all kinds of precision testing parts and pieces together but here when we're actually going to bone guides and we're putting everything together so we've got our files we're using a combination of diagnostics and some of the real cases going through our implant placement and then this will be a bone reduction guide. So this is where we used AI software to look at our CT, segment out the teeth and transpose that CT into an STL so we could make something out of it. So I've got the original teeth, I've got the diagnostic teeth, so I know where everything goes. So for this type of procedure to work, everything has to fit perfectly. It can't move. You can't move because this is a major, major surgery that the oral surgeon or the periodontist or the prosthodontist or the general surgeon is going to do. So kind of the steps we go through, again, printed dentures, going into our surgical software, putting the teeth in the right positions, and then printing everything out. Printing teeth, printing guides, and again, all of these things have to fit with precision like a puzzle. They can't kind of fit. They have to fit perfectly. And that's why a fully calibrated system from print to cure is so important. I mean, when you're looking, just make sure if you're not printing, if you are printing uh, and you're looking for other printers, make sure that's what you see, that's what they're offering you, because it is so important. And we go to the ultimate on precision with some of the things we do here surgically. But look how those two pieces fit together. I mean, they just fit perfectly together. No, wo no wobble, no movement, perfectly together. And it fits on the bone, again, perfectly together. If you're wondering, the bone was printed on a different printer with a larger print plate. And then the final and everything put together. <clears throat> so we also do the same thing with guided, but instead of reducing bone, we use the same technology and the printing to be able to guide the surgeon in placing bone. So one of the things we've kind of developed here is a process where we figure out where the teeth go first and then place the implants kind of regardless of where the bone is. Not totally. I mean, I, I don't mean to say, you know, we kind of, we have to take into consideration the native bone, but as you can see here, our implants are maybe a third out of bone. So we're going to design this and we're going to use our software to make um, to design the bone in such a way that we can print out a very accurate model to be able to use as a guide for bone augmentation. And we've been very, very successful with this procedure going over and over. So when we are doing this, So same thing. So we're going to put the teeth first, put the implant second, and then on the screen, build the bone where it needs to go. But again, when we, and we've used AI software to take the CT into an STL so we can do this, but you can see there's a lot of area on the implants that are not covered in bone at this time. So we have changed and put everything in and then with the implants in, once we turn the implants on, so now the CT is gone, we brought in the STL, you can see very clearly where there's bone and where there's not, then we actually developed bone blocks here in the laboratory, and we can go cover up those implants. So we put the teeth, then we put the implants, and then we're going to grow the bone digitally so we can create a very precision model that the surgeon can then bend and apply his 
titanium mesh to. But again, it has to fit perfect. It has to be perfect. The ecosystem that we're using this for has to be perfect and precision. So again, we've, we've grown the bone, or Dr. Mandelaris has grown the bone exactly where it needs to be with us working together. But we can only do this because of the precision of the model making technology that we use. We'll actually be presenting this at the AO meeting this year. So if you want the full version, come to Arizona. Because we've had very, very successful cases using a digital design to place the bone and get it exactly where it needs to be. And then placing the implants. So last question of the day, is milling, will it become obsolete? So will milling, so it's kind of a different question. So will milling become obsolete? Yes, I definitely think so. It's not gonna become obsolete in the next two years. But when we talk about printing and we talk about all the materials and where we are, we had very, very low strength, low quality, low aesthetic materials. But now we've got highly wear resistant materials and very, very strong materials. Uh, and they and this material, especially sculpture, has been tested in so many different universities. We've got abstracts going to the AADR and IADR on all the research we're doing on this material. And the aesthetics rival porcelain. I mean, this is this is a printed nano ceramic. Stained and glazed because there's a kit for doing that also. This is a case in the mouth that we put it in as a permanent. Because we are starting to do permanent restorations. I have two in my mouth. And we're, I figured the, <clears throat> the best thing to do would be watch, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, watch it on my mouth. So we actually did this one as a permanent restoration. And so far, holding up very, very nicely. This is yeah, maybe eight months. And an implant restoration. So we're doing all of our um, implant all on X. <clears throat> this picture you see on the my right is jaw in a day where we're doing major maxillofacial surgery and then shell temps on the left everything printed, the palatal positioner, everything printed very, very nicely out. So again, our go-to material, sculpture, Accurita. To be able to do some amazing things <clears throat> in surgical. So again, our last thing that I'll show is we've moved, we're, we're now moving away because we've developed another procedure where we can go from kind of the big hole theory to doing an actual final temporary on a model with tie bases. And again, the precision of the print has to be perfect to be able to do this. But now we're skipping conversions completely and going straight to temporaries. So a printed guide, tissue, retention pins, implants. And then the implant just snaps right in. And that is a combination of soul, Accurita, Accurita soul, and pack dent sculpture to be able to do this. So we've, we've skipped over the entire conversion process here. So I would like to thank um, Accurita and pack dent for allowing me this time today. I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. So I will unselect my screen, Tom, and go back to you to see if there are any questions. But to the audience, thank you so much for spending this time with me this morning. Thank you very much. Awesome, Lee, thank you. And, and thanks for answering the question, is milling obsolete? I think we heard it right from uh, from your mouth and that is, hey, it's not going anywhere yet. Um, but you know, printing, we see what can be done with, with 3D printing at really, yes. I don't want to say a fraction of the cost, but substantially lower than what we're accustomed to seeing in mills. Um, and, and those of us that have been around in dental long enough keep, continue to see these, you know, improvements and next generation products. 
that keep you know um you know is is something going to be replaced yeah over time most likely uh but nothing to fear right away but what a great time now right to get into 3d printing thanks for sharing what you're doing now lee um we do have a couple questions for you though lee we're not going to let you get away yet um okay so um here we go with um so <clears throat> well this one um how are the wear characteristics between milled PMMA and rodent sculpture permanent crown? And I don't know if that's for you or for Ryan. Well, I'm just trying to get my camera turned back on. Okay. So I'll start. Uh, Ryan can jump in there. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's a little difficult to tell clinically because it depends on the patient and all kinds of things. But in the research, so we've got research going on at Boston University, Alabama, University of Washington. So John Sorensen are, are, and I are doing a massive study, studying all of them. And one of the things we are measuring against is either pre-made denture teeth and as well as milled denture samples. So we're seeing that these high strength ceramic, highly filled ceramics are actually coming out better than the milled material. So clinically, like I said, it's tough to tell. You've really got to get the same shape, the same pressure, the same amount of time to really measure those. But we've got, like I said, a big, big study at University of Washington with Dr. John Sorensen going now. So we'll have a lot of definitive information a little bit later this year. Okay. Okay. And then uh, another question, uh, some, similar to the, uh, that topic, what resins are you using for final restorations? I think you shared that, but if you want to just repeat that again. Sure. So I'm using the same resins for temporaries that I do for finals. Mm -hmm. So all we're, all we're doing is, is really changing. So it's, it's the sculpture, the pack dent sculpture, rodent sculpture material. Uh, we have tested every, we also have every other material available out there in our laboratory. And we've done opacity studies, uh, translucency studies, shade studies. And yeah, I'm not just saying this because I was on the team, but we are very proud of what we have accomplished with road and sculpture as far as where which goes back to ryan and the r d scientists and aesthetics which i help them work with but uh it's a it's a very very nice material we're very we're very excited about it okay and then oh, good and then lee uh from kenneth uh, knapp um what do you see as the future for zirconia restorations uh, milled or printed <clears throat> So, good question. So, it, and I've had this argument several times with several people uh, with different printing companies and different material companies. So, where we are with printing zirconia right now is the ability to print zirconia that looks like zirconia did 15 years ago. So, I don't really get all excited about it because what comes out at the end looks like the first zirconias we were working with when we were just starting on this. So, you know, if they can get the translucencies and layering and all the things that we've evolved to in zirconia, which, you know, I'm certain they could, but uh, I don't see it anytime soon uh, because milling of zirconia works really, really well and is very predictable right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good. Um, one thing we didn't uh, speak about, and I didn't do this in the intro, and I don't think we brought it up here is, you know, what differentiates uh, the Accuretta Sole printer is the multiple build plates, um, three different size build plates, a sure. large, a medium, small, depending on, you know, what you intend to print. If you can bring it, if you can drag it from the slicing software to the smaller, build, the, the, the smaller of the build plate, there's less waste of resin. It also increases the speed. Um, the yep. question here from Mike is, and you know, I'm, and, and that's really designed for chair side, right? Because when yes. when we're chair side, you know, we're, we're speaking to to Lee at Sculpture Studios, CEO and CDT, and this is a laboratory and you know a high put uh, a high production facility. When we're looking at doctors and clinics um, printing chair side, right? The, the amount of printing is going to be a little you know difference as far as um, amount. Mm -hmm. 
therefore, you know, we have the three different build plates. So if you're printing a three unit bridge or, or one or two uh, restorations, you can do it at the same time and you can do it in, you know, 18, 15 to 18 minutes with a small build plate. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that we do have three different build plates that, that you can use for the printer, because the question here from Mike is, are you using the Accurata printer for the uh, majority of your production? And is the build plate size, does that limit you? Now, I'm assuming you pretty much just use the large build plate, maybe a medium or small for a emergency procedure that maybe you weren't intended to uh, produce that day. Um, can you mm -hmm. comment on that, Lee? Sure. Uh, and to, I mean, so we do have larger printers, especially for models. Um, the larger print plate um, printers that we use essentially for models because they're always big. Uh, they're tall. Uh, if, we, if we get into bone models, then, you know, we just don't have room on some of the smaller ones. But we're using our Accuritas for pretty much everything else because of the precision, especially the precision fit uh, of, the, of the teeth into the denture base, which is uh, on some printers very difficult to achieve. So denture bases, because we can get several on there, several teeth if we're angling them correctly, um, splints, um, surgical guides, things like that. Uh, we basically use our larger format printers for models because we do print a lot of models. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> good. Awesome. That was, that was good, Lee. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a question regarding LCD and DLP, but I know, Lee, you've experienced both of them. Um, anything you want to uh, talk about uh, with the two types of light projection um, in the printer that you've been able to see? Sure. So, and again, trying to, to be transparent and honest as I can. So the main difference that we've seen is size of printer and how much room it takes up on your, on your counter. For a laboratory, it's not that big a deal. For a clinic, it's a big deal. So when you're using LCD versus DLP, the size of the printer can be a lot smaller achieve the same thing as a much larger printer and still have the same build plate size. So, you know, even though it sounds a little strange, having a smaller printer and a smaller footprint and platform uh, is very important. Uh, and we can get all the same, we can get all the same positives with a smaller footprint. With printing, and again, we, we haven't actually done a study to probably need to, to look at accuracy DLP versus LED. Uh, but we've seen excellent, again, when we do these, these guides that fit together, they just fit perfectly coming out of that Accurita. I mean, it, it's like a puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and just, you know, some people are concerned with LCD and we have those 54 LED lights in that screen. Uh, the lights are only used for what printing is being accomplished. The whole panel doesn't light up, in other words. Uh, we're seeing up to 10,000 hours on, on each one of these screens. And the great news is every printer, we include a second screen, which is very easily interchangeable if needed. Uh, mm -hmm. So thanks th thanks for sharing that with us. Sure. And, and I know when we go on our website and you look at our, at our uh, equipment, and sometimes people are taken back a little bit. Um, it's measured in millimeters, and, and oftentimes people think that's inches. Um, the sole printer is approximately 13 inches deep uh, by 14 inches. So it has a very, very, very small footprint. And then, of course, Curie and Washi um, are very uh, small. And <clears throat> as, as, uh, as we heard in a, in a review by a MOD, you know, small but mighty was, was the phrase. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it pretty much fits in in any operatory. You do not need to have um, a dedicated, you know, uh, room for your printing system here. Um, okay, uh, we 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 took on the resin uh, questions, temporary and permanent. We took on uh, DLP and LCD. I'm just seeing if there's any more coming in. You took care of what you use uh, the. the what you use mostly for your printing needs. We spoke about the three different build plates. Uh, that you have options for when using the sole printer. You don't need to buy three different printers. Um, 
uh, here we go, uh, from Michael Anderson, considering that we accept dentured teeth with processed acrylic to a titanium bar, is it is it definite full arch prosthesis? Would you consider a full arch, would you consider a full arch permanent crown resin supported by titanium bar as a, um, yeah. Lee, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you just, okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we still have clients that don't want zirconia against zirconia. Um, you know, if we're doing uppers and lowers, uh, a lot of them do, but we have people that would rather have zirconia against PMMA, acrylic, printed, whatever. We print all of ours. But uh, to do a, um, a denture design over a bar with printed denture base and printed denture teeth, absolutely. No question. Okay, good, good. And um, Lee, I know we're, we're already past the time where we're, uh, we see some people dropping off. Um, but I appreciate your time today. Uh, Ryan, um, I know you had you popped up your screen there. Did you want to make a couple of comments regarding uh, some of the uh, rodent sculpture material? Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to circle back and show some of the wear characteristics. Um, Dr. Giordano of Boston University, let's see if I could share my screen real quick. He provided a some third party testing versus um, a couple different materials. So let me see. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, we just see a uh, great backdrop there. Uh, nothing yet, Ryan. Okay, let me see. Sorry about that. go how about now uh i do not see it let me take off my camera here okay so if not let me just go ahead and describe it for now if you got anyone's interested please email me and i can share this graph but um in terms of uh, wear rate, uh, we have Shofu and Teleocad uh, products. I believe those are PMMA. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Lee. <clears throat> but um, the wear rate for those are, are 24 millimeter and 18 um, millimeters over a million cycles. Um, and then for uh, some of the competing uh, 3D resins, we have Denka, Bago, and Pactant, um, of which um, the wear rates were 4.3 uh, millimeters, 1.9 millimeters for Bago, and 1.4 for Pactent. So there is a significant drop off in terms of um, wear rate. Yes. So. Okay. And then if anybody wants to look into the chat, I know Dr. D Giordano just responded uh, regarding on a wear question uh, from BU. And uh, you can see that in the chat as well. Um, just want to remind everybody, right, the uh, where to get our products, uh, Accurator products can be purchased through uh, Atlanta Dental Supply, Burkhardt Dental, Cadre, <clears throat> and now Henry Schein Dental uh, in the Americas. So uh, reach out to your favorite rep there and uh, give him or her a call and begin printing. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody um, at Chicago Midwinter and Lab Day, and then, of course, all of our upcoming um, webinars. Uh, to provide you with more information, keep you up to date on 3D printing, uh, especially with Accuretta. Um, and, and don't forget, um, make sure you jump on our webpage to, to research any other information you have. Lee, thank you for the presentation today. Um, you're welcome. Always, always great just to you know hear from you, see you, um, and see what you're doing. Um, what's that little town in North Carolina called that you're in? Apex. Apex. <laughs> Great little Apex. town if you ever want to do a little sightseeing and head down and see Lee. Uh, Ryan out in California, good to see you as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, anybody that did register for this, uh, a, a copy of a recorded version will be sent to you. Enjoy the day, everybody. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.